Okay. Uh, I'm Carolyn Merrick, Program Coordinator here at the Center. Um, and you know why you're here to see Olga talk about the Torlonia marbles. And uh, I'm as eager as you to hear about it. So um, I'll just turn it over to Olga. Yes, hello. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing fine. And here we are on this new adventure, the Torlonia marbles. Let's go through this, the technical parts of it. Okay, so let me share my screen and start from the beginning. So here we are. Uh, when I was there to take a look at the, at the exhibition of the Torlonia marbles, I honestly forgot to take a picture of me with a statue. So I took this picture with the catalog that was printed, of course, just for the exhibition. And uh, it is a really, really great edition from which one can learn a lot, not just about uh, that event, but uh, also about the history of sculpting, restoration, and uh, so much of that. And uh, there are some uh, details and a bit of a gossip that the, um, the catalog doesn't really go into. And uh, I'll share a little bit of that with you to explain the, the whole background, you know, why is this such a, such a big deal and uh, who are these uh, Torlonia uh, guys and marbles. So he was their coat of arms. Now coat of arms usually means like nobility. Yes, it is nobility. But uh, for the Roman tradition, it's a very recent nobility, only a couple of hundred years. So Torlonias uh, came from France, and uh, uh, that was in 1764. I will not be giving you too, too, many, too many years. It's all happening within a span of two centuries, so it's not that difficult. And uh, so 1764, anyway, is the beginning. There's the uh, Madlino Torlonois or something like that, who comes to, to Rome as, uh, as attendant, uh, like a sort of a butler, of an abbot, later a cardinal, who left him uh, considerable wealth with his will. And uh, he, Marino, started a uh, little business with uh, selling um, fabric, textile, silk. And uh, his son Giovanni was really, really smart. And uh, from just dealing with uh, um, trade, being merchants, they start uh, giving money, they start loaning the, the money, they open like a small bank. And they started loaning money to very wealthy noble families, actually formerly wealthy uh, noble families, who remained with properties and titles, but uh, uh, they had very little cash. So they enter into the banking business. Uh, uh, they start uh, uh, working for the Pope as well as uh, uh, ad financial advisors. Eventually they arrive to the point that the Torlonia family help the Pope get the loans uh, from the Rothschilds. And not just once, uh, uh, throughout the 1800s, several times. You may imagine how uh, controversial that was. But in the process, Torlonias uh, acquired the title of uh, princes and dukes and uh, marquises of different properties. And uh, this is their coat of arms, where you see the rosebuds, the family is budding. And uh, uh, there is like a comet. So they really wear a comet on the um, sky of the Roman uh, nobility. So why am I showing you the little kids uh, jumping around? Well, uh, this is an ancient Roman aqueduct and uh, that is today a public park, Parco degli Aquedotti, the park of the aqueducts. But it was a huge property called uh, Roma Vecchia, the old Rome, and the Torlonians came in possession of that land. When you see ancient Roman aqueducts and roads, and then you start digging, you always find something. Rome is all about layers. So they very wisely acquired a lot of these huge properties where they would have the sharecroppers, peasants working for them, and they were getting money from the, from the land. But at the same time, they did the excavations. Throughout the 1800s, they excavated enormous amount of statues and uh, mosaics reliefs uh, from their lands. And this is an ancient Roman road. Anybody can, can go, it's, it's a favorite place uh, where we go for like a little picnic and there, there's a huge amount 
of um, ancient aqueducts. Now you will see here, this is just a short video. This was the land that was all owned by uh, Torlonias. And uh, there are also lands uh, north of Rome. This is in the southern suburbs of Rome. But outside of Rome, there are the properties uh, of which they became like princes and, and dukes. And wherever you see like a little rundown uh, farm that might as well be Torlonia property even today. This, this farm is, uh, is their, their property. They were not very much beloved by their, by their peasants. So uh, in the process of getting really wealthy and digging all around, just consider the uh, Torlonia, Alessandro Torlonia in the 1800s uh, had 22% of the land of the Papal States. So that's a lot. And when we say the Papal States, it's all around Rome, uh, between the Tyrrhenian and the Adriatic. And uh, there were so many ancient Roman properties, uh, villas, suburban villas, and those were eventually bought by the nobility of, of Rome and eventually ended up in Torlonia's uh, hands. So excavations upon excavations, banking upon banking, really good social um, relations and uh, networking. And this is today a museum, Casino Nobile. Uh, there is a, a land called Villa Torlonia and it's owned by the Italian state today. It was abandoned after the Second World War and the state bought it from, from them. And there are 13 buildings in the whole property. It's a beautiful, beautiful park. You can see even an obelisk like Egyptian obelisk. Well, uh, the Torlonia who started building his property here on the land that was owned by the Colonna family. Now, when we say Colonna in, in Rome, uh, that's like, wow, Colonna, you know, they had the Pope uh, uh, in the 15th century. If you saw the movie Roman Holiday, uh, where Gregory Peck uh, and Audrey Hepburn look at each other and she realizes he's, uh, he's a journalist, that amazing hall is in the Palazzo Colonna. And Torlonias intermarried, of course, with Colonna, Borghese, uh, Orsini. Orsini's had uh, three popes and 34 cardinals. Torlonia never had a pope, but they intermarried with five noble families within two generations of which four had popes. And the fifth one had a few cardinals. So they were very, very wise. So at a certain point, Alessandro says, I'm gonna build this huge, huge thing and I want Egyptian obelisks. So he writes to the Viceroy of Egypt asking for two actually Egyptian obelisks and the Viceroy, well, never replied. So that's when he had the ob two obelisks made in uh, Baveno quarry in Northern Italy transported all the way, imagine the buffaloes uh, pulling uh, the ship along the Tiber and then on the Anna River. So we even have the, the obelisks here. This building, Casino Nobile, was uh, uh, rented to Mussolini. Uh, Mussolini and his family lived here. His famous uh, uh, balcony is in the central square of Rome, uh, Piazza, Piazza Venezia, but this is where the family lived for a symbolical uh, rent of una lira, one cent. And there's even the atomic shelter, the bunker that can be normally normally visited and the museum inside this uh, beautiful building. And uh, uh, it's all built in this neoclassical style. That was their major thing, the antiquities and then imitation of the antiquities. And inside, this is the hall where Mussolini watched movies. Again, it's a, it's a museum today. This green thing here, that's a bit of contemporary art. They have temporary exhibitions as well, but there's plenty of neoclassical. As here, you see, this is not ancient, ancient Roman, but it's the imitation in that whole uh, fashion of a couple of hundred years ago, returning to the classical beauty. And you see little, little angels, like in Roman times. Uh, this is a beautiful theater. And uh, Alessandro Torlonia loved uh, when now in, in the 18, 18, 1800s, uh, he loved parties. And when he inaugurated the, the erection of the obelisks in the memory of his parents, mm, imagine the, the guests. Uh, there, was a there was a Pope, uh, Gregory XVI. Of course, the Pope 
took uh, was taking the loans from Torlonia, so uh, he better be there at the party. And there was um, the famous uh, Ludwig of Bavaria, the German king uh, who built the Neuschwanstein, the, the Disney castle, that fun fairy tale. He was known as the fairy tale, fairy tale king, so he was there as well. And the parties were a great way of obtaining good social uh, uh, con uh, connections. And uh, the people who came to visit Rome on the grand tour, the Torlonians knew that England would be more important uh, uh, very soon, would become very important. So they sent their kids to study in London. Alessandro studied in London. That was very far-sighted because French was a sort of lingua franca, but no, they knew English because of the industrial revolution. Who has the money? Who will travel? Who will buy antiquities? Who will use their bank? British. So a lot, a lot of parties, a lot of parties here. And uh, this is a fake medieval little building, one of the 13 buildings in the, in the park. It's another, another little museum today. And uh, uh, it's a museum of um, stained glass. You can see beautiful windows. There's a bit of fake Roman ruins just for the, for the good measure. And this is Villa Albani. Villa Albani, uh, I did not share the, mm, the photos from the internet, which I wasn't sure about the copyright, but this one is fine. Uh, this is Piranesi, the engraver of the, of the 1700s without Piranesi for so many buildings and areas in Rome, we wouldn't have an idea how they looked like in the 1700s. But this is Villa Albani today. Uh, it was built by the Cardinal Albani. He was a nephew of the Pope, usually cardinals uh, who become important. They, they are somehow connected with the Pope directly. And uh, uh, it took him 50 years to build this beautiful villa. And it was just to house his collection of art. Uh, same thing like with Gallery Borghese. We had this uh, uh, presentation on the Gallery Borghese and the same thing, the Cardinal Borghese built the, the whole villa, the whole beautiful building just to house his collection of art. And his private librarian was Mr. or Herr Winkelmann, the German historian who basically is the father of art history and classification of uh, art of the classical, classical times. So he had uh, a map maker, Mr. Nolly, engraver Piranesi, Winkelmann, the librarian. So the most important people in art of that time were with the Cardinal when he was building this villa. And uh, in 2014, the Torlonia, another Alessandro, the names are repeating in the, in the family, uh, founded what is known as a Fondazione, the Foundation uh, Torlonia, which also has extraordinary works of art that are not part of the exhibition that we're going to see. Because in this whole process, they amassed almost thousand pieces and they had their own museum in the 1870s. They started their own, their own museum. And that one had 620 statues. Of those we're going to see, not all of them, but they chose 92. But what is in the Villa Albani, in the Fondazione, is not exhibited and probably never will be. Uh, what you're looking at are the fourth century BC Etruscan frescoes. They're called the, the tomb that was found in one of the possessions of the, of the Torlonias, was discovered by an archaeologist, Francois, and that's why it's called the tomb, the Francois tomb. And these are the frescoes from, from that time, and all the Etrusca, Etruscanologists are dying to, to see them. You can act, this is Charon, uh, who's taking the dead across the sticks. Like in, the, in, like in the Greek mythology. And you could, in normal times, uh, you could call and make a reservation for the visit, but they would send you the date which was fine with them. So it was really, really difficult to find the time and uh, the possibility to see this collection. It was theoretically possible, but actually really difficult. And they were offered recently 7 million to uh, land, land the uh, works of art, the Tomb Francois especially, to one of the state-owned museums for an exhibition and they refused. 
Well, seven million, you know, when you are worth two billion, seven million is like a change in your pocket. So they, yeah, they, don't, they don't want to bother with that. And uh, uh, they also owned the hotel in Gilterra, England. Here across the street is one of their main residences currently. And this is where a lot of the travelers from Grand Tour would come, Hotel Inghilterra, England. Marli Marino Torlonia, you see on the streets of Rome, sometimes you can run into these inscriptions uh, with their names uh, because they, they did a lot for embellishment of the streets of Rome. And they also had some charitable organizations and for some communities, uh, they, they, they did a lot. For example, there is a, there is a church with them um, a, a relic of a bambino Gesù, baby Jesus, that is believed to have the power to heal little children. So the Torlonias, since they lived in the neighborhood, uh, they provided a, a carriage to carry the relic to the sick children who uh, couldn't walk to, to touch it and to pray in the church of Araceli. So they, they did, they did uh, some charity and good works uh, as well, apart from amassing this enormous, enormous fortune. And they were always in love with ancient, as you will see, this is an um, ancient Roman sarcophagus. Now, this is the main square, Piazza Venezia, and this building with the tower to the left, we are just next to the huge white monument called Vittoriano. That's another presentation that, that you can see both on, on my site and on your, uh, your YouTube channel of Centerville. And where you see the building with the, with the tower, there was a Palazzo, Palazzo Bolognetti, which Dorlonias bought in 1807. And this is where they housed a huge collection as well. But when Piazza Venezia was uh, urbanistically organized the way you see today, a lot, a lot of Roman old buildings were knocked down to make room for bigger squares and wider streets. So some of that art is preserved and most famous one is the statue of Hercules and Laika. It's not ancient Roman, it's uh, Canova. So a couple of hundred years. Canova was uh, the most important neoclassical sculptor. And this is an extraordinary statue, which is uh, today in the gallery of modern art in, uh, in Rome. There's Laika, poor thing, who brought the poison shirt to Hercules. And Hercules was in so much pain that he killed his little friend who, well, was not really guilty of anything, but that's Greek mythology. Now, just a few more words before we get to the exhibition. A lot of the statues also came from this valley. The castle that we're looking at was not owned by Trelonius, but by Piccolomini, another family that had a pope in the family. And it's today a museum that houses the collection of reliefs and of generally finds that the Trelonius found in this valley that you see behind the, the castle. Now, that was a lake huge lake, the third biggest lake in Italy, called Fucino. And Fucino was a moody lake. So the level of the, of the water would rise incredibly in just like a week or two, um, 30 feet, 40 feet. So it was, it was a, frequently a disaster for the, for the locals. So even ancient Romans worked on uh, um, making like a sort of a, of a tunnel that would canal like an emissary that would regulate the level of the lake. And they partly managed Emperor Claudius, but Alessandro uh, Torlonia decided to drain the whole lake. And uh, uh, we're talking about 1850s for 20 years. It was a huge, huge thing, as you may imagine. Uh, the engineers who were French, uh, English, Swiss, because at a certain point after working for the Pope for such a long time and dealing with his finances, consider also that the Torlonias um, had um, a mandate, a contract to administer the Pope's monopoly on alum, salt and tobacco. Now that's money. 
Uh, alum today doesn't mean much to us, but alum, the mineral, was used to fix the dye in the process of dyeing the, the fabric. So it was extremely, extremely important and, and requested. So with all that money, however, uh, Torlonia realized that there is no progress with the Pope, that it's all very old fashioned and it's going to remain like that. So he goes, ventures into business with the French to build the railroads, something the Pope wasn't keen on. So that's why he chose also to, to work with foreign engineers. And there were like 500 farms here, but they were expropriated by the Italian state in the 1950s. But uh, uh, it was a very, very, it, it is a very fertile soil. Just didn't work out the way they wanted because some of the, of the plants could grow in the microclimate that was present before, but they could, they cannot anymore. So they grow mainly potatoes, but they're good potatoes. So this is where they used to say, a novelist wrote about them. It says, you know what they say, at the top of the world, there's God. Then there's a lot of nothing, nothing. And then there come Torlonias. Then there come their armed guards. Then their guards, dogs. And then there's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then the peasants. And that's it. So they did not earn the reputation of being very warm people. I'd say quite, quite arrogant. But there we go. These are some of the things that they found as they were drying the lake. And they are in this museum, Cesano in Abruzzo the region south of Rome, southeast of Rome. They're beautiful, beautiful pieces. But now let me show you where they kept 620 pieces. This may look like a rundown neighborhood, but don't be deceived. This is Trastevere, the neighborhood across the river, across the Tevere. But here to the right, if we could knock on the door, there's John Cabot's University that's also renting from the Torlonias. And this nondescript building to the left is where they kept their 620 statues. This is their coat of arms. And you see the rosebuds and, and the comet. Now, just across the street, there's the Villa Farnesina, beautiful museum, frescoes by Raphael, owned by a banker and then by the papal family. Then another palazzo owned by another Pope uh, and today another museum. So that's the neighborhood. And uh, in this nondescript building, they had this museum. Also the first catalog with the photographs, not engravings, which we're going to, to see when we get to the exhibition. And not everyone could, could go and see that amazing uh, collection, but just uh, their friends, the, the scientists, archaeologists, the nobility. It wasn't like a public museum. And uh, that's why it was so, so, so precious. And they have the biggest and the best private collection of antiquity in the world. And in 1970s and 76, the Torlonias asked for the permission because in Rome you have to have permission for just about anything. Change your window, shutters, no, you can't but uh, to repair the roof. So that sounded, well, good enough. So they get the permission, they close the museum, they close the building and poof, nobody ever saw those statues anymore for almost 50 years. They were stashed somewhere, basement, ground floor, whatever. And we saw some say basement, some say, well, anyway, it doesn't really matter because nobody could see them. And they're like national treasure. Instead of restoring just the roof, they turned this building illegally into 93 studio apartments for rent. Why not? So there we go. There starts the, the story, the, uh, the problems with the heirs who sue each other. Uh, in uh, 2012, Getty uh, comes in and they want to buy the collection. Mr. Berlusconi, of the former prime minister offers 125 million of his own money. No, they refuse. They seem to be willing to export all that to Getty or at least put the Getty 
would choose. Then the Italian government jumps in. They sequester a lot of their property. There's a whole, still there are legal problems, but eventually they managed to make a deal with the, the Italian Ministry of Cultural Heritage. And finally, uh, 92 pieces are at the Capital Line Museums. Now the museums are closed again. So I was really, really lucky to be able to see that exhibition. It was sponsored by Bulgari, who have done a lot in Rome, Spanish Steps and many other, other things. And they're still planning on doing more. So we are here, if you look straight, these are the steps uh, to the church uh, of Araceli with that Bambino Gesù, the baby Jesus uh, relic. To the left is the Vittoriano, uh, the wedding cake monument. And to the right are the steps leading to the Capitoline Museums. And in one section, there's the Collecting Masterpieces exhibition. So a few more steps. And we are inside. This gentleman is going to be the part of the exhibition, obviously. And here we are. The, we are greeted by Germanicus. Germanicus was the, the father of uh, Caligula and the grandfather of Nero. So two, well, famous nutcases. And it's the only bronze statue in the exhibition because bronze is so, so rare. If it was found in the Middle Ages, uh, it was uh, melted down for weapons and utensils. It had uh, um, the reason it, it, people needed uh, weapons, uh, uh, they needed metal, and the knowledge of uh, producing metal was lost. So whichever bronze they could find, people melted, melted down. So sometimes in the countryside, they run into the pieces made of bronze. And now we'll, we'll talk a lot about the, the restoration and integration. Uh, there was this taste when there was a whole craze about antiquities in the 1700s, especially 1800s. Uh, they didn't really like uh, broken statues and they're all broken, they're old. So a lot of the, of the sculptors worked as restorers and they would integrate bits and pieces as much as, the, as they could because nobody wanted to buy a broken statue. They cared more about appearances than authenticity. Today, it's, it's completely different. It's a different, different trend. And uh, Germanicus, for example, his, his right leg, his right arm, his whole head was, was restored based on the type of the, of the statue. Okay, this could have been Germanicus because he liked to be likened to Alexander the Great. So, and this is funny. Uh, fringes that he has, uh, bangs. So uh, a lot is arbitrary. We frequently cannot, cannot tell if the statue was this or that. And there he is, the father, <laughs> the man who gave us Caligula and Nero. And behind him is a collection of the busts. They're mainly members, or they're either emperors or the members of the imperial uh, imperial families. So we see some uh, famous faces, like for example, Caracalla. Caracalla was uh, the emperor at the beginning of the third century, and his father, Septimius Severus, was also the emperor, and he killed his brother, uh, Geta, or Geta, and uh, they say that he got him this throne and was never in a good mood after that. Well, do we know maybe he was like that even, even before? But Caracalla was also famous for having given uh, the all the free Roman citizens the right to um, citizenship, basically because he wanted to collect more taxes. And uh, his nose has been restored. Now, most of the statues have their noses broken because they are, well, the most fragile part of the statue. So they come to us without noses, ears, the necks break, the limbs. Uh, a lot of the statues that we know from the antiquity, they're basically just the torsos and then reworked. If this face looks familiar, this is Hadrian, second century, and he was the first emperor who uh, started wearing a beard. They say it was because he wanted to hide the scars from juvenile acne. And 
a beautiful book, but not an easy read at all, but one of the most beautiful books of the, of the past century is the memoirs of Hadrian by uh, Margaret Ursenar, the, the French writer, who be, the only woman to become member of the French Academy. And uh, uh, Hadrian is famous for his system of fortifications, the Hadrian's Wall, and in, in between England and Scotland, the Pantheon, the famous Pantheon, and uh, uh, also the villa in Tivoli, the Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli. It's a huge property and many, many more things we could talk a lot about Hadrian. And uh, uh, this is one of the rare busts where also the bust is antique. Uh, most of the busts that you see around him are actually modern, 18, 1900s, uh, uh, but that's, that's the original, the original one with the uh, Gorgon, the Medusa, which has this, it's called apotropaic or warding off evil or scaring the enemy's purpose. Or any scary mask is actually uh, like that, you know, warding off evil. And uh, the ladies did not have much choice uh, of clothing. So they had to respect very strict rules, especially if they were of higher origin, obviously. So where they would uh, get whimsical was with the hair. So that's where you sh could show that you're wealthy, your status was all in your hair. That if you had this elaborate hairstyle, it meant you could afford the slaves. And the ladies from the imperial families, they were frequently uh, the trendsetters or the influencers of, of their time. So dating of the statues frequently goes back to also the hairstyle. Well, this the same as in the like 80s, you know, we can all tell which, which photo was taken in the, in the 80s. Uh, a lot of these busts uh, are also modern, like all the way to the right, you see the lady, this is very, very obviously uh, 19th century bust. It's a lady who is named here, Elena Fausta, connected with Constantine, but they're not sure is it his mother Elena or Helen or is it his wife Fausta or his daughter Helen if you don't have anything written down it's difficult to say and this is another lady from the uh, Caracalla's family uh, that's actually his mother the wife of Septimio Severo and uh, there is a very lovely lady uh, here not well, this one is lovely as well, but I wanted to show you the, the mother-in-law of Emperor Hadrian. It's, it looks, to me, it looks like Metropolis, you know, that Fritz, Fritz Lang movie from the 1920s. And yes, most likely uh, this is um, the portrait from the 19, 19, early 1900s. Some of them, you know, you can't really tell because to determine the, 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 um, the age of a piece of a stone, you have to do these very complicated mineralogical and there are many smart words about how that's determined. So it's frequently difficult to, to say if something is modern or just ancient or done in, this, in the same fashion. And these two are, are different. Uh, for example, the, the young girl to the right, she looks very Etruscan. She comes from Bolshi, from the, from the area where there were the Etruscan excavations, but she's not Etruscan. Um, it's an Etruscan style. And the old man, very realistic. When you see these very, very realistic portraits, they usually go back to the first century BC. And uh, with him, uh, it was, it has always been a, a big puzzle. You know, is he like a fisherman? The, the hat is, is modern, but he had a hat. So it was restored, but was he a fisherman? Or is it a hat that is actually like a royal insignia of the Macedonian or Greek kings? So we really, really don't, don't know, but he's one of the most famous faces of the, of the exhibition. And a lovely girl, you can see she was much more adorned than, than she is. You see the, the holes on her ears for the earrings and uh, her hair, and there was gold and stuff on her uh, to embellish her hair. And here her eyes are hollow because that's where the glass paste would have been or, or ivory to create the, the gaze to make it very realistic.
they were not not white we'll talk more about that a little later and uh here is another republican portrait uh, uh extremely extremely realistic uh when you see these just think of the old republican uh, tradition in a sense before the empire in ancient rome to have the um, the um, faces or the busts of their ancestors in their homes in the porticos to, to protect the family in the future they, they would even carry these during the processions and the way they're made they're not idealized and uh, uh, that usually goes again back to the republican times so slightly into the imperial so we are around the first century bc first century ad the, the latest vecchio di otricoli from the location where he was found the old man from Otricoli. And after this very severe gentleman's face, uh, you see his eyes do not have holes because they were painted. When there are holes, then there was glass based. If they're smooth, they were, they were painted. Now we proceed through the exhibition and there's this beautiful nymph Nymphs are the minor divinities of the Greek mythology, accepted very much and very gladly in the Roman one. And they are the divinities of the rivers and lakes, uh, and they're splashing around. And this lovely lady is represented in a gesture of taking off her, her sandal. And frequently they are paired with the satyrs. The satyrs are these creatures that lived in the forests in the, again, Greek, mythology that was adopted by the by the Roman and they were having a jolly good time together sometimes the fawns would join in they are the guys with the goat legs and how do we know this young man is a satyr because he has this pointed ear they had pointed ears and little little tails frequently they're mixed up sometimes they call them fawn satyrs but uh, generally speaking satyrs would be the ones with pointed ears and uh, getting drunk all the time uh, following Dionysus in the processions. These two are dancing, they say, invito alla danza, the invitation for dance. There are many, about 40 examples found. Uh, there are all these replicas made in the Roman times, replicas of the Greek originals. But in the case of these two, they're found together for the first time on the property of Torlonia and the coins represent the pair together. So it means that for the first time they were discovered in their original setting together, a setter sort of inviting a nymph to, to dance with him. And then we have a very, very typical um, work of art for ancient Greeks and then Romans. There are really no, so very few bronzes uh, that survive from the fourth, fifth century BC from Greece and what we have are the Roman replicas. And uh, two of these were found, the ones to the left were found uh, in, the, um, in the area of, the, of nowadays air, near the airport, Ostia. Uh, there was a town of Ostia where there are also very interesting excavations and the port that was built by uh, Trajan, Claudius and, and Trajan, the emperors. And the Torlonias came in possession of that cool land and they found amazing amount of of art there a lot of these statues the athletes are frequently represented like washing themselves or pouring oil or sometimes uh, you know tying the ribbons of the victor around their head frequently we again don't know so the easiest thing to say is always oh he's pouring oil but for this one he comes from the caffarella another property today public park of the Torlonias, and uh, this young man is tying the, the ribbon that symbolized his uh, victory. The palm branch was also a symbol of victory. That's where it goes into Christianity, where the palm branch is for the martyrs, because the death as a martyr is a victory in, in God. So it starts with the Greek athletes. And their nudity is, is um, athletic. We have nudity in these statues, which is either heroic or um, athletic or divine. And even, for example, Napoleon, when he conquered all of Europe, uh, he commissioned the statue of himself as God Mars, nude, of course, with a little fig leaf. 
to cover up at least something. So uh, it goes back to uh, the Greek fascination with the perfection of the body. And this young man, his head is a restoration. And you see the, um, like the scar on the, on the neck, but the nose is fake restoration and the, the scratches on the face are also fake to give the illusion that the statue is antique. The statue is, but not the face. There you see a little better how they scratched it so it would look old. And uh, this is a lovely statue of the uh, abundance and peace. So the two of them, that's a Greek uh, motive that was again adopted by the Romans. The cornucopia was the addition, the cornucopia, the corn of plenty with the edibles overflowing. But you can tell this is the model that finds itself, finds its way into the Christianity as well. There are these models of um, mothers with the, with the babies like the Bacchus and Semele or Isis and Horus, uh, or in this case, the, the peace and, uh, and abundance. So the iconography kind of continues. The beautiful statues, very white. You know, there's been a lot of polemics about the, the cleaning. They had to get rid of the, of the wax and dirt, uh, and uh, maybe they made them way too white uh, because originally they, they, were, they were also painted. But you can see that the yellow is the original part. And then where, for example, the arm, the arm is completely a, a restoration. And this is the famous relief of the, of the port that I mentioned earlier, where it shows the activities that are taking place in the port of Ostia. Romans had two major ports, one in Baia near Naples and uh, Classe in Ravenna. So the, the Ravenna on the Adriatic and Baia for the Tyrrhenian Sea in the, in the Mediterranean, but Rome had Ostia. And, here you see to, down to the left, uh, there's uh, Neptune, the god of the, of the sea. Up at the corner to the right, there's uh, Dionysus with the panther. And we see the eye, again, the apotropaic eye, which pre uh, preserves the peace in the harbor and wards off the evil and protects the sailors from the evil divinities. Now, in the middle is the famous lighthouse of Ostia, where they still found some pigment left. That is another proof that these statues and reliefs, they're all painted, but the pigment faded. And the artists of the Renaissance and Baroque, like we start with Michelangelo, Bernini, they all thought the statues were, uh, they're white. But in the recent times, they, the archaeologists started using and restorers very gentle methods, like even just ultrasound for cleaning the statues. And they're running more and more into the pigment, the original pigment. You see on the, on the veils here at the, the bottom in the, in the center, you see twice the she-wolf with the, with the twins, the symbol of Rome. And this is a ship that just uh, sailed in. So you see some people busy on it. They're probably sacrificing some animal to some gods, you know, to thank for the safe journey. And this is the only Greek piece. Uh, goes back most likely to the fifth century BC. We see the young man with the horse followed by a dog. But in each corner at the top, there are the figures with some legs, that's what has remained. So most likely the divinities to whom this young man is bringing some sacrifice. It's extremely rare to find Greek pieces. Even in Greece, you find the Roman pieces that are the replicas of the Greek. Now, when I was in, in Athens, uh, I had to go to Pirae, to the harbor of Athens, to, to see a few really important and, and great statues in bronze, because even the archaeological museum in Athens doesn't have that many. There we go. Little legs of the divinity and the lovely, lovely dog. So now sarcophagi. Romans 
chose between cremation and, and burials, depending on the family wealth, depending on the tradition of the area. If there was plenty of wood, there was more creation, there was more cremation, and it depended on the, on the traditions. It had no religious connotations. And this is a sarcophagus. They're now mainly from the second century. And it's a sarcophagus of the so-called centaur, who was a very learned person. You see, he's surrounded himself with the philosophers, with their scrolls, and the, the ladies with these little, little horns here. They're the muses. There were nine muses inspiring different arts. They were daughter of Zeus, daughters of Zeus. And when you look at the lady in the, in the center, her face is not finished because that was the wife who most likely died much later and for whichever reason, her face was never finished. Many of these sarcophagi were uh, sold as the pieces that had to be finished. You know, it was the whole thing was done, but the faces of the deceased had to be done when that person died. So it would be a sort of a, of a portrait. So this is a beautiful piece. See smart philosophers and, uh, and the muses. And the death mask, the, the masks were used by the actors in the Greek theater to express a certain mood. The actors did not act with their own facial expressions, but with different masks. And you can see them in many museums as decorations as well. And on the sarcophagi very, very frequently. And this is another beautiful sarcophagus with a very, very popular motive, which are the labors of Hercules or the fatigues of Hercules, he had to earn a pardon for having killed his wife and the son, but he was made crazy by jealous Hera. I mean, who wouldn't be jealous? I mean, her husband had 71, they say, illegitimate children. So without him having all that illegitimate children and without Hera's jealousy, the Greek mythology would be much more boring, but like this, it's quite exciting. So Hercules was his offspring and the strongest of the heroes. And here we see the sequence of his heroic deeds. We go to start to the left from his killing of ne so-called Nemean lion. And then he starts wearing the, the lion skin. And you see his face here, he's young. And uh, as we arrive to the far end, he's older, he has a beard. So chronologically, it's all chronologically. Uh, carved and uh, these are the so-called Hesperid gardens from which he had to bring these golden apples and uh, the guardian snake is sleeping on the corner at the corner of the sarcophagus so the whole life of uh, the whole labors of, of Hercules on one sarcophagus and now there's a beautiful Tazza, Tazza Albani. Uh, Tazza is like the basin in, uh, uh, in Italian and the pedestal is modern, the, 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 um, the hold, the thing to hold to the tazza are also uh, handles are modern. And you can see again, Hercules. And here he's uh, killing the Hydra, the monster. And inside, just be prepared. There's the head of Medusa. There's always been a head of Medusa in that uh, uh, basin, but this is a, uh, modern one from the 19th century that replaced the, the old one, but it follows the pattern. That's how it was. Medusa, the Gorgon Medusa, who had those snakes, and uh, Perseus, uh, the hero, cut the head of the Medusa, who was transforming her enemies into stone, or whoever looked at her directly in the eye uh, would become stone. So he the Perseus shined his shield and was kind of looking at the shield and hopes, I don't know how, but anyway, cut, cut her head and gave it to, without looking all the time, gave it to Athena who put the head on her shield so she could petrify her enemies. And then we know there are some famous designers who used Medusa for their brands. So it's quite scary. And now we continue through the exhibition. There are beautiful pieces. These are always river gods. Uh, they look like mature gentlemen, not young men. They uh, carried the cornucopias. Uh, they were the fountains, they were in the gardens. Uh, and this is the restoration of a fountain and the river god as Nile, because you see the Sphinx to the right. 
So that gives him an identity. Then there's this beautiful, beautiful young man. Uh, this is a part of the collection called Cava Ceppi. Cava Ceppi was a restorer and a sculptor who had a big studio that everybody went to from England and um, he died in 1799. And his uh, method was studying the pieces and then giving them integrations based on the historical research. And this head he named Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemy were the dynasty, one of the two dynasties that inherited uh, the kingdom of Alexander the Great. And they got Egypt. And this could also be anyone else, actually, but uh, he was named Ptolemeo, Ptolemy, Re d'Egitto, King of Egypt. So that was the family that ruled Egypt. Cleopatra was uh, a Ptolemy. She wasn't Egyptian, she was, uh, she was Greek. And there we go. Ptolemeo, Re d'Egitto, as he was named by Cavaceppi. Uh, the family bought the whole Cavaceppi collection uh, at the auction. And now the two warriors who originally were not together, they were placed together in the Museum of Torlonius and uh, some of their characteristics were changed. These are probably some Greeks against the Persians. There are all these mythological and actual uh, battles that were very popular in, uh, in art. But for example, the, the warrior with the mustache, that, that's not his original mustache that was added later to give him some kind of a Celtic identity, but he did not originally have mustache. Here the head is, uh, is antique, restored quite, but it's, it's antique, although it looks very white, but uh, I read at least it was antique. And again, our Celtic warrior. Now the ram, is cute, but it's not so much about the ram whose head is also integration, but about the gentleman hanging underneath, that's Ulysses. You know how he killed the nasty Cyclop, Polyphemus, and Polyphemus was blinded. So he was looking for uh, the warriors who were the Ulysses' friends who were trying to escape and they found a way because the, the Cyclop had sheep that would have to go graze in the morning so Ulysses and his uh, buddies are hanging on the sheep underneath and that's how they managed to escape from Polyphemus. I remember that scared me a lot when I was a kid. There he is, the hero Ulysses. And now the conversational piece, uh, uh, Apollo and Marcia. Apollo, the god of beauty, uh, who was also very vain and what happens when somebody challenges a god? Well, that's why he's holding this skin because Marcia, the satyr, was stupid enough to challenge Apollo, but he found um, an instrument that Athena threw away. So it, and it was made by, the, by Pan, the, the god of the forests for Athena. So it had this amazing sound. And Marcia, see his ears, his satyr, he thought he could challenge Apollo. And of course that didn't go well, so he was played. And in this statue, only the torso is antique. You see the, the head, the, the arms, they're all integrations. This is the antique part. And uh, at Marcia's feet, we see the, the flute that he found. Athena threw it away because she loves the sound. And she played and played and played, but then she realized she just had a glimpse of herself in, uh, in the water surface in, in a lake. And she saw how, how ugly her cheeks looked like when she was blowing into the flute. So she threw it away. She was vain too. So that's how Marcia, poor thing, ended up flayed. These were like conversational pieces that would be in these wealthy people's uh, halls and they would, entertain their guests. Now, this is another collection, Giustiniani, the family that also had cardinals, collectors. They had a collection of 1,200 statues. They are dispersed all over the world. And the most, because they, of course, ran out of, of money as well. But we're talking now about the 1600s. They were also protectors of um, uh, Caravaggio. I'm going to talk about Caravaggio. And uh, one other time. 
and uh, here we have more of the of the emperors and uh, uh, some they say okay the second one here like it's Caesar maybe yes maybe no and then Augustus and uh, Tiberius Claudius uh, so the busts were all the all the rage Antoninus Pius with original this is the whole original restored but original and then two modern uh, Lucio Vero and young uh, Mark Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius. And this is Vitellius, but this is probably pseudo antique because such exaggerated characteristics that, that was not typical for the antiquity. So it's most likely relatively modern bust of an actual emperor, Vitellius. He's kind of cute. And this is Hestia Justiniani. Now that sounds important. Justiniani, again, is this family of, of collectors of the 1600s. And this is um, the most preserved, the best preserved Roman replica of this type of the statue, which is Greek in origin. So fourth, fifth century BC, but a Roman replica. And it was the question of social prestige to have your portrait painted with the uh, with this lady or to have something like that in your own in your own collection so this is one of the most most famous pieces actually it was most likely first made of bronze because you see when the marble statues are made as replicas of bronze that they need these uh, stunts um, that support the the marble because it doesn't stay as strongly attached as as bronze and also the type of the of the hairstyle this would have been very typical for a bronze. These ba heavy bangs would have been typical for a bronze statue. This is now um, Isis looking for Osiris, or maybe it's Ceres, the goddess of, of agriculture, Proserpine. And this is a time when, <clears throat> sorry, Kavachepi was no longer around. And uh, so they would just order whatever they wanted so say okay i want this statue to be the goddess of agriculture so let's put some wheat in her hand and we'll give her the identity or it could be pelagia the the goddess who you see on the ships at the mast that protects the the ship again it's difficult to to say this is a heavily restored warrior the head is antique and the pelvis is antique but this is the the position that was actually copied from a drawing by Raphael. It's a lovely, lovely old head. And Medusa again. Gorgon Medusa with the snake coils instead of the hair. And then the satyrs, satyrs. And this is a way of putting together the collection. It was very fashionable to have two statues, like double. And this resting satyr is a, a prototype, is Praxitel, the, the sculptor from the fourth century BC. <clears throat> and the Cardinal had two. Uh, it's an important piece of the statue where you see this transition from archaic to classical, uh, where you have the position of the body, the counterpost changes, and he needs to lean onto something because he's totally off balance. And he's got the panther skin because he's the, the friend of uh, Dionysus. So the two of them. And talking about the two, apart from the satyrs and the panther, the symbol of Dionysus, this is a drunken satyr. And that's what they did the best, chasing nymphs and getting drunk. There we go, the little horns too. Now the Venuses, uh, these are also Roman replicas of the statue of Crouching Venus from the third century BC, the original was lost. And the first one in front of us, the head is restored, most likely by Pietro Bernini, the father of Gian Lorenzo, who worked, both worked for the Giustiniani for the Cardinal. And so this head is um, a restoration. And this is not. So this lovely, lovely Venus still has her original, original head. There are different types of Venuses and one standing or the modest Venus you know, covering uh, herself. This is a crouching Venus. And now let's take a little walk through the whole 
hole and end up on this lovely ram or the goat. Now, the statue is old. And you see, it was probably somewhere outside because of the, how the fur is worn out. But the face of this goat is way too eloquent. It's Bernini. Uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini uh, made, did the restoration of this head uh, and uh, it actually becomes famous after that. This goat, the greatest of all times. The greatest goat of all times. very intense anthropomorphic they would say she's almost talking to us or he's almost talking to us. now there's a very popular motive of the little boy fighting with the goose uh, for the gardens especially and a typical representation of artemis for eastern roman empire in ephesus it's uh, very typical in the museum in ephesus you can see in turkey some of these statues and then all over the ancient Roman world, also in the Matican museums, in the Capitoline museums, and uh, the, the goddess Artemis, she's again the goddess of fertility, she's like mother nature, you see all these little animals, and most famously these, well, what would they be? They're not breasts, and they're not eggs, they're not gourds. Uh, eventually the archaeologists and the art historians agreed that those well are bull testicles because the bull was, has always been a symbol of life force and fertility and fertility, also the phallic symbols, you know, they're like cosmic virtue because uh, we all depend on it. The, the, the crops depend on fertility, the animals, uh, children, everything's there because of the fertility. And the bull is the symbol of that. So the tastiest part of the bull for example, Italians make a salami. Let me not tell you how it's called. You can ask me later if you want to know. But uh, um, they would give it up as a gift for the goddess. So they would invoke more fertility for the farm and for the family. And all kinds of animals, some mythological, some are from the real world, made part of Artemis baggage. And then this must have been like a funerary monument of a lady who probably had a shop where she sold, well, meat. Very realistic. The tombs would frequently have something that would tell you about the, the craft that they did. And another uh, famous uh, tazza, the, the basin, Chesi, from a garden in the 1500s where it was paired with a satire like the one you can see on the left, who was holding a wineskin that was a fountain. In origin, these gardens were near the Vatican originally, but uh, they're no longer longer there. It was a Chesi family, and uh, the the basin has the the legs and the rim restored. But this is a satire that used to be the fountain. But on the basin, you see well again nymphs and the satires doing what they do the best, well just having a jolly good time. Now another sarcophagus with uh, Hercules, but with the so-called non-pertaining lid, even the two, uh, the pair, they, they don't come from the same period. See the hairstyle, always tells us the era, and then the head of the gentleman just doesn't, doesn't fit chronologically. Then this is a beautiful sarcophagus with the lion and uh, lions always popular in funerary art and generally in heroic art. This was probably a tamer of the wild animals. You see how he's coming out from behind. Or maybe it was a magistrate who organized the venatio, the, the animal fights before the gladiators would show up in the amphitheaters. We don't know. And Athena, now we're getting closer to, to the end of the exhibition. Athena with her symbolical helmet and uh, uh, olive tree and also the little owl and of course Medusa uh, on her chest. The little owl, the symbol of Greece, the symbol of wisdom. This is already Sforza Cesarini collection. That's another family that uh, the Torlonias intermarried with, the only one that did not have the, uh, the Pope, but they had a couple of Cardinals, another river god, where only the chest 
is actually original. This is a philosopher, Chrysippus, third uh, century BC, Stoic philosopher with restored head, and also the sandals, as you will see from Carrara marble, lovely sandals, even, even today. So that's Sforza Cesarini collection. And this is the catalog, uh, one of those catalogs from late 1800s. Visconti family was known. They also worked for the Pope. They worked for the nobility all over. And this is the first catalog with the actually uh, phototypes. That's like the um, ancestor of photography. But for the first time, it's not incisions like the uh, if Anyone wants to, later on, you can always write to me, as you know, uh, there is, um, if anybody's studying collections and collecting, there is a so-called Galleria Giustiniani, and if you can download it, it's free, uh, the PDF online, all these amazing incisions of the Giustiniani collection, but those are incisions, these were for the first time, uh, the, the photographs of the sort. And it represents all the pieces. I just picked up a few. And the Hercules, but Hercules made of 117 pieces. That was the so-called uh, uh, pastiche, popular, especially in the 1700s, but even earlier, uh, it's not really that it, there was always a need to restore like that, but it was also showing off the skill. What are we capable of doing? It's not the only statue of that kind. There is in um, a Diane Insee Blunder Museum in Liverpool has another statue like that, in Insee, I-N-C-E, uh, Diane, and she's made of 120 pieces. Just uh, consider that these statues were covered with wax and they were observed with the torches. Uh, uh, they did not have the lights as we have today. Even Michelangelo, when he was painting his Sistine Chapel, the lights were completely different. So maybe he needed those bright colors because of that. We just have to put ourselves in the shoes of someone who lived, well, centuries ago. But this Hercules, we call, they call him Frankenstein, Hercules. It's kind of cute. And as you come out of the exhibition, uh, there's this beautiful hall with the pieces that uh, the Pope uh, Sixtus IV gave to the people of Rome uh, um, this she-wolf and also uh, the little boy pulling out the thorn from his foot. Not everything uh, is normally here. Uh, the big statue of Marcus Aurelius is there because this whole section of the museum was built for it, this glass roof around it. The original is here now. The copy is on the Capitoline Hill, Campidoglio. It wasn't melted down in the Middle Ages because people wrongly believed it was Constantine. Constantine. He was the she-wolf, the symbol of Rome, with Romulus and Remus at the Renaissance addition to this ancient statue that is most likely Etruscan, 5th century BC. He was Constantine, 4th century first Christian emperor, and he's kind of looking at uh, Marcus Aurelius from the other side of the hall and say, hey, Marcus, you know, you are there only because they believed that you were me. And Marcus Aurelius seems to say, well, give me five. Thank you for that. And this is what I could do about the Torlonia exhibition. Uh, it will probably, hopefully, travel to Louvre and then to United States. Who knows? The future is really unpredictable at this point. The, the Italian government has put aside 35 million to restore a palazzo near the Colosseum, and the collection will be, will be probably placed there. Uh, maybe it will finally become a public museum, but it will remain the property of Torlonia. It will not become the property of the, of the state. And once you're done with the exhibition, you can walk down to the ghetto and uh, uh, the Jewish ghetto in Rome is famous for excellent food, especially for these fried artichokes, Jewish style. So that's something that you absolutely have to do to conclude the whole tour. And I hope you enjoyed it. When in Rome, that's what you have to do, go to see an exhibition and then Go for some food. Good food, always good food. Wow, Olga, wow. Um, 
That was stunning. Thank you so much. I'm Anybody happy. have any questions or comments? I have allowed you to unmute yourself or you could put them in the chat. We have another 15 minutes or so. Okay. Hello. John? Yeah, can I ask a question? Sure. Early in your presentation, there was um, a fresco of uh, an, Etr an Etruscan fresco and it looked like uh, a group of uh, men fighting. Mm -hmm. They all had swords either buried in each other or hanging in scabbards. Was that um, Etruscan funeral games or was that some battle or, or what? From, from what I read, it's about the Trojan War. Oh, okay. Although a Trojan War is Greek, obviously, but right. uh, these are from the fourth century BC. So, and Homer is like 8th century BC. So what I found was that it was um, a Trojan, Trojan warriors. Uh, I know that the, the Etruscan funerary rite included the fights of the, um, of the warriors and that's where the gladiator games actually come out from, from the Etruscan funerary rites. You, you probably had that in mind. Yeah, right. It was the funeral rites at the gladiator. Mm -hmm. Games exactly. Run, mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was. But for, what I found about the, the, the fresco Francois uh, was the Trojan, at least from one that I, that I was looking at. Mm -hmm. I don't know them very, very well. Uh, I didn't go that much into them, but uh, I, could, I could go back. But I do remember one part was about the, the Trojan, Trojan warriors. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, I wanted to, to add something, of course, you can ask me any, any, any questions anytime. Um, forgot to mention that you have somebody in US that you've seen so many times, but didn't know that a lovely lady has the Torlonia's blood uh, in her. Uh, her grand, grandmother was Torlonia, Brooke Shields. Hmm. Yeah, and her grand grandmother was uh, from the Moore family, the railroad. Uh, um, Industri industrialists. So Torlonia marries into American railroad business. Elsie Moore, I think, was her name, and then Marina Torlonia, and then her son. You know, so they're all. Marina marries her her daughter. Sorry, marries Frank Shields, the tennis uh, player, and then Brooke Shields is the the grandchild. Well, there you go. Wow. <laughs> Karen asked, will Olga, in all caps, <laughs> will Olga be leading a travel group through the center? Will she be giving more presentations? She's a wonderful speaker with so much knowledge. Thank you, thank you. Well, that's what I normally <laughs> do, do for a living. Um, I, I work for this uh, big American agency, Talk, um, Talk. I've been with them for 10 years, but I also do, apart from working for them and coordinating some of their tours, I organize tours for my private clients. So yes, ho I hope so, I hope so. But in, in the meantime, you know, why not? I believe that this virtual world is going to remain in a certain segment. I don't think it's going to go away completely. So maybe when I'm older <laughs> and, and retired, maybe I'll do just the virtual tours if there's still anyone interested and if I can remember things. <laughs> but um, yeah, well, this is my site, olgarome.com, you know, I. I would love the tourism to come back and take people around actually, but I would also like to continue doing, doing these presentations because I, I actually like how it's, it's coming out. I hope you like it too. Very much so, very much so. Uh, that's a possibility. I will talk to our travel department as well. And the second question, will she be giving more presentations? Um, we do have one on the books. It, the description isn't totally written yet for May 20th uh, mm -hmm. from 3 to 4 p.m. called A Pilgrimage to Rome. Yes. And Olga, if you want to describe what that's about a little bit. It's pilgrimage in Rome. Uh, we just did the churches of Rome and that was the sort of a um, generic or my choice of maybe about 20 churches in Rome out of 900. But the pilgrimage in Rome is a very specific uh, way to, to visit Rome. And uh, there are seven churches, which are the Sette Basilica, seven basilicas that have to be uh, visited. 
as, as a pilgrim. And then there are the holy doors and there are certain rituals. And then there is a tradition of the Jubilees that started in the year 1300, celebrating the anniversary of the birth of Jesus Christ. And it's been held first every 100 years and then every 50, every 25. And the Jubilees are a really interesting occasion uh, for the pilgrims to come to Rome. Millions normally, normally come. And it's a really, really interesting tradition. And I used to work with the pilgrims. Uh, I must say I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Catholic, but uh, I worked with Catholic pilgrims in, uh, in Medjugorje, in ex-Yugoslavia, and I entered into that world. It was in the 80s. And they say that's where the six children saw the Blessed Mother. And it was a completely different world for me. And it, eventually I ended up in Rome and I encounter frequently people who want to know about it, want to know, okay, which relics, uh, where do I go to pray for this? Where do I go to pray for that? Because, you know, different saints have different uh, tasks and they can intercede for different prayers. And there are reasons for that. So I hope you will, you will join me. We're also um, thinking about doing something on just the Caravaggio, right, Carolyn? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't have the date, but um, you can also ask, you know, Bernini, Caravaggio, Michelangelo, why not? Anybody else, questions or comments? You can, like I said, unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat. I think you can unmute yourself. Let me double check. Yes. <laughs> well, well I, do you have any questions? <laughs> well, I just, I, I'm just uh, flabbergasted that um, at the wealth of the Torlonias, and then when you said they had 22 percent of the, they had, oh, yeah. they had of the papal states. Woo. In the past, the papal states were like a belt. Uh, that cut it in two halves and they arrived to have the 22 percent of that territory that's that's enormous mm -hmm. and their wealth uh, has become a bit of a synonym with uh, with embarrassment mm. and there was this movie called uh, romanzo criminale uh, the criminal novel novel about the crime something like that uh, about a gang that actually existed in italy in the 70s and Banda della Magliana. And one of the bosses is entering into this, I don't know what it is, Lamborghini, whatever. And he's entering into this car and he says, only Torlonia and I have this kind of a car in Rome. <laughs> Interesting, wow. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, there is a question, where did the marble come from? The marble, the, I love that question because the marble came originally in all of the Roman Empire, they had the quarries uh, because we're talking about ancient statues. Mm -hmm. So they had the quarries in Egypt, in uh, uh, Greece and Turkey a lot, uh, in Europe as well. You can find the maps of all the quarries and different kinds of marble. In the case of the Torlonias, there is very few. There is one statue with Marmo Bijo, that the gray, the gray uh, marble that is the st statue of Isis or Ceres. That's, I believe, from Asia Minor. And uh, um, if it's a red porphyry, it's from Egypt. Uh, the white marble, there are two major types. There is so-called Marmo Pentelico, which is Greek. And then there is, a, today we call it Carrara marble, but it was called Luna, Lunense, uh, because the quarries were not called Carrara at that time, but they are in Northern Tuscany. They're like the cathedral under the earth of like white marble. It's absolutely stunning. I used to take groups there when I worked as a, as a tour manager. So it's extremely difficult to say. Sometimes um, if you look at the marble, if it has crystalline, coarse granulation, it is most likely Greek. If it's very soft, soft, so to say, it looks like it, like very small, tiny granulation, it should be Carrara. But to really tell, you have to do something, it's called like isotopic something, and then determine, there's no really uh, an answer to each piece, unless it's... Um, for example, certain kind of yellow, oh, there was only that quarry where that giallo antico came from Tunisia, from Northern Africa. Certain kind of porphyry, 
uh, which is not marble but granite, only from Egypt, because that kind is from there. But it was all over the, the Roman Empire and it was brought to, to Rome. Hmm. That's fascinating. But yeah. the white is mainly either Greek or uh, today Carrara, but Luna for the, for the Romans. Yeah, it just seems like there's so much of it, you know. Yeah. yeah. The restoration is sometimes done uh, in the old times. All kinds of things were done, you know, the iron clamps that would rust eventually. So they had to put the lead around them to prevent the rusting of the surface. Now they use more brass. And there was a lot of resin used and marble, uh, marble dust, marble powder to fill in the, the gaps and do the restoration. So not so much of the actual pieces, but in the past, if you go through the museums, you find a statue and it says, oh, not pertaining head, but head looks fine. It's also old because they would find such an abundance of these heads and legs and torsos and heads that they would take them, you know, stash them into the workshops and they said, okay, put it, put it together. Oh, mm. okay. Well, this one, mm, no, not that one. This one fits, boom. So whatever fitted, so you, you, may, you may have the arm from who knows where and then the leg from, from somewhere else. And then another piece restored. Today, we are much more careful about that. But imagine in the past, you know, who was really paying attention and writing down about everything? Right, right. It's important to sell the statue. And if the guy wanted the whole statue, the whole statue he'll get. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, I once heard where the words... Um... Sincere comes from sine sera without wax. Do you know this? Or is this maybe it was wrong? Sincere, but <laughs> sincero, sincero, yeah, sincero is uh, sincere or honest. Uh -huh. Something honest. about well, I learned where the statues. Um, if you went to buy a good statue, you know, mm -hmm. they said it was sincere without wax. That wasn't filled in. There were no nicks or cuts or might or, might might as well be. You know, I'm I'm really learning every every, every day, so we can. Google that later. <laughs> sincere statue? A sincere statue. Oh, no, oh. senza cera. Senza cera. It is, exactly. It's two words. Yes. It's senza, S-E-N-Z-A, without cera, C-E-R-A. Senza cera, without wax. Yeah. B, but when you said sincera, I said sincero means sincere. Oh, yeah. No, it's yeah. senza cera. I think the Latin was sine sera, but that's sine all sera. the Latin I know. Sine sera, si, si, si. So it's just that in, in my ear, it sounded like sincere. Right. Sincero. Gotcha. No, no, senza cera, si, without wax. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for coming. Well, thank you. It's just wonderful. Unbelievable. Thank you, thank you very much. It was excellent. Thank you. Yeah. It thank was you, wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am.